anything, anywhere, anytime. When was the last time you heard railroading speak of such commitment to customer service? I'm deeply grateful for the opportunities America has given me, but the giant American corporations who control our economy don't seem to feel the same way. They certainly don't act like it. Sure, these companies wave the flag, but they have no loyalty or allegiance to America. There's no such thing as low-hanging fruit when we started at a 63 operating ratio. But as we look forward from here, uh, what we're doing is we're implementing precision scheduled railroading and that plan for us is called the Unified Plan 2020. To that end, in the fourth quarter we also talked about uh, we're, we're in the process of eliminating about uh, approximately 500, 475 jobs. We're, we're in the process of eliminating about uh, approximately 500, 475 jobs. We're, we're in the process of eliminating about uh, approximately 500, 475 jobs. Uh, we've also removed about 200 contractors from our payrolls, and uh, there's more of that to come. And uh, there's more of that to come. And uh, there's more of that to come. Managers at Union Pacific uh, won't return to work tomorrow. We knew layoffs were coming since August. Today they began. Joe Chiero is live at Union Pacific, where we know hundreds will lose their jobs. Joe. John Mallory, I talked to the professor at UNO today who said that events here over the past couple of months for Union Pacific have been a little bit concerning. And that's because back in May, they started laying off thousands of uh, their union employees, giving them furloughs. And now today, the number of their employees, which is at 8,000, continues to shrink. That's because today they began laying off hundreds at the manager level. At one time, Syracuse, New York was like a second home to me. At least once a week, sometimes more, I would pick up refrigerated loads of dairy at the various burned dairy plants all over the city. Over in East Syracuse, there was a small diner type restaurant in a strip mall that I would eat at. They had good food, friendly service, and CSX's East Syracuse yard directly in the back. One late evening I pulled in and with no time to spare I heard the unmistakable throb of GE power getting closer and closer by the second. As fast as I could I grabbed my camera, opened the shutter, and this is what I saw. There was also a time in the early 1990s when San Antonio, Texas was my home and I lived right next to the SP Sunset Route where Southern Pacific and Santa Fe diesels were an everyday sight. And it was a painful reality that they both disappeared just a few years later. Though we know the fate of both, the patch nose and numbers of the Union Pacific and the BNSF could not cover the indelible memories of a different time, two different corporate identities, and a very different style of railroading. The 90s left me with memories of the SP and Santa Fe that will never be matched by its successors. In later years, railroads big and small across America would be commemorating their individual histories with specially painted locomotives in the colors and or paint schemes of their predecessors. But today, it's September 14, 2007, and more than a decade since losing their own heritage, Southern Pacific AC 4400 CW number 6377 and Santa Fe-9W number 669 look almost as good as they did in their pure state. So with all of that said, when I titled this video, The Survivors of the Supermergers of the 1990s, I'm not just talking about the locomotives or the railroads. I'm talking about the people like me who remember living through it. Union Pacific is the last major United States rail system whose name, shield-shaped emblem which dates back to 1886, and yellow color dating back to the 1930s has never changed. Going from its charter in 1862 and further on to build the nation's first transcontinental westward from Omaha, Nebraska. The construction began in 1865 and was completed on May 10, 1869. Through its lifespan, it went on to acquire a consortium of other railroads including Chicago and Northwestern, Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis and Omaha Railway, Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad, Litchfield and Madison Railroad, Chicago Great Western Railroad, Chicago Rock Island and Pacific Railroad, Southern Pacific Lines, St. Louis Southwestern Railway, Northwestern Pacific Railroad, Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, Denver and Salt Lake Railway, Western Pacific Railroad, Sacramento Northern Railway, Spokane International Railway, Missouri Pacific Railroad, Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad, 
Chicago and Eastern Illinois Railroad, Texas and Pacific Railway, and Midland Valley Railroad, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Gulf. During its rise to dominance, the Union Pacific saw attractive partnership opportunities in the Missouri Pacific, which served the South Central States and the Gulf Coast and the Western Pacific, which connected Salt Lake City with Northern California. The Missouri Pacific's north-south routes complemented UP's east-west structure, and with its nearly 12,000 miles of track, the Missouri Pacific was actually larger than the UP system. The UP-MP merger was challenged by many smaller western roads, but was eventually approved by the ICC two years after the application. The resulting merger made UP the third largest system in the nation at that time. In 1964, Union Pacific had proposed merging, or should I say gobbling up, the Rock Island Railroad. The merger should have gotten quick approval as the government was favoring end-to-end -end mergers at that time. The merger would have given the UP entry into Chicago, something it did not have at the time but later got with the CNW, while the Rock Island's Kansas City to Kumkari line would be spun off to the Southern Pacific, which it eventually was when the entire Rock Island Railroad was ripped up, parted out, and sold off 10 years later due to the dinosaurian slowness of the ICC, which caused the UP to walk away from the deal. The initial plan of division of the Rock Island was only part of the ICC's master plan for four super railroads in the West that was built around the BN, the SP, the UP, and the Santa Fe. Under that plan, the Union Pacific would get parts of the Rock Island, the Chicago Northwestern, and the Southern Pacific, probably their old Central Pacific. Southern Pacific would get the Kansas City Southern, the MKT, and the Texas and Pacific. Santa Fe would get the Missouri Pacific, the Western Pacific, and the Rio Grande. And finally, Burlington Northern would also get part of the Rock Island. To be sure, such visionary plans had been proposed many times in the past, but never came to fruition, and instead of four mega railroads, which would have been best in my personal opinion, the Wild Wild West ended up with just two. During this time, the Southern Pacific was at its zenith with no thought of merging, especially with the UP, and so the question lingers. How could the Southern Pacific Railroad, once the third largest U.S. corporation, have fallen the way it did? In the 1940s and 1950s, the SP was envied by the transportation world for its plant, its equipment, and its strategic dominance of the Great Golden West. However, big challenges were ahead and the railroad's executives and directors managed these rather poorly. Now I could end this topic right here. It just sounds too familiar. Unions consistently blocked any efforts to reduce crew sizes. Of course, as you and I know by now, these problems would eventually be overcome by way of the Staggers Act of the 1980s and by the end of full crew caboose laws. But by that time, the SP was too far gone. Why? Because it chose to invest in non-railroad ventures while the railroad itself was just an afterthought. Again, the story just sounds too darn familiar. By 1980, the starving of the railroad of capital was apparent in congestion brought on by a lack of track maintenance and expansion of sidings and double track, plus a shortage of locomotives. Unreliable service began to drive customers away. The cash cow was starting to run dry. During this time, merger mania was sweeping the railroad industry in the 1960s and 1970s, but the arrogant Southern Pacific figured they didn't need to merge. But when the Rock Island went bankrupt, the SP's highly profitable Los Angeles and Chicago route suddenly ended at Santa Rosa, New Mexico, smack dab in the middle of nowhere. With few, if any other options on the table, SP bought enough of the old Rock Island to get them to Kansas City along with part of the old Alton Railroad to get them from St. Louis to Chicago. But by then it was too little, too late. Having spent their past profits on those non-rail ventures we talked about earlier, maybe they should have learned a lesson from the Penn Central. There was no money left to upgrade these new properties as their non-rail ventures weren't running much in the way of profits. 1982 was the warning shot for SP as Union Pacific made it clear that it was taking over the Missouri Pacific. And that's how UP became on par with Southern Pacific in that Texas and Louisiana chemical business that we talked about earlier. In 1983, UP bought out the Western Pacific from Ogden, Utah to San Francisco and siphoned off 75% of Southern Pacific's business on the parallel line and SP was left out in the cold. The one bright spot for the SP was that they had come up with a major innovation, the first double stacked freight train. But again, with no money to bring it to full fruition, they had to sit back and watch as the rest of railroading picked everything clean. 
what was worse is that all of this happened just as the Long Beach San Pedro terminals were beginning the container traffic revolution. With nowhere else to go, SP sought a merger with the Santa Fe. Unfortunately, the ICC voted the merger down in July 1986, and although both railroads appealed the decision, the battle was lost in June 1987. In October 1988, the Southern Pacific Railroad was sold to the Rio Grande Industries, then the parent company of the Denver and Rio Grande Western, and as a result of the botched merger attempt, SPSF came to stand for Shouldn't Paint So Fast. What would it have taken to get the SPSF merger approved? SP and SF paralleled each other from the Bay Area to Texas via Southern California. However, if SPSF had been willing to sell to UP SP's lines from the Bay Area to Kansas City, connecting with UP's former MP at El Paso, the competitive concerns might have been mitigated. <laughs> Are you confused yet? The SPSF would enjoy Santa Fe's superior routes with SP's access to St. Louis, Memphis, and New Orleans. The Ogden line and possibly the Oregon line could have been sold to Rio Grande or maybe the Rio Grande could have been included in the SPSF so SP's lumber drags could use this route rather than tying up the Transcon. A three railroad west could have been possible if the weakening Southern Pacific Rio Grande had been divided amongst survivors Burlington Northern, Union Pacific and Santa Fe. Or at least I think that the Rio Grande along with the Western Pacific might have meshed well with the Santa Fe Missouri Pacific combination. It said that the ex-Santa Fe president, John Reed, had a chance to take down Missouri Pacific but stumbled in his own ignorance. Now UP dominates Gulf Coast chemical traffic. And now we have a two railroad west, which number is the same as the number two of railroads that can possibly compete on any given major city pair. Cast out and on its own, the beleaguered Southern Pacific found itself being swallowed up by Rio Grande who later sold out to the Union Pacific. And so what do we have to learn from this story? Arrogance can lead to such conclusions that we are better than you, therefore we don't really need you. Unfortunately for SP, they learned the fallacy of that thinking too late. The container business and piggyback model which they helped pioneer was being established and which would soon become a major component of railroad freight traffic. Much of the industry, like Conrail and neighboring Santa Fe, got the model right by catering to non-unionized long-haul truckers like J.B. Hunt, while Southern Pacific got it all wrong. Like the Union Pacific, the BNSF has its own family of predecessors. The Toledo, Peoria, and Western Railway, the St. Louis, San Francisco Railway, the Alabama, Tennessee, and Northern Railroad, the Colorado and Southern Railway, the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railway, the Northern Pacific Railway, the Great Northern Railway, and the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. On September 25, 1995, the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Pacific Corporation agreed to merge. The two were holding companies for the Burlington Northern Railroad and the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway, which together formed the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Corporation. The important part of the BNSF merger was this. First, it truly was a merger, and second, it called for the two railroads to combine operations over a period of time before a formal merger was complete. This allowed time to operate the Burlington Northern and the Santa Fe as separate railroads while the details of the final combination were sorted and smoothed out. So as it was on December 31st, 1996, the long history and mystique of the Santa Fe ended along with the quarter century long history of the Burlington Northern and on January 1st, 1997, the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railway started the new year as a fully integrated railroad network. Getting back to the UP, with amazing speed, its so-called merger unraveled into a series of service and safety snafus. The SP takeover, that is. Analysts estimated that UP lost hundreds of millions in revenue as customers diverted shipments with hundreds of customers threatening to take business away from the railroads. Its railroad safety record was marred by three fatal crashes causing seven deaths in just three months. Its routes west of the Mississippi River slipped into total gridlock with thousands of freight cars backed up in the Houston area alone. In an interesting gaffe, a Waverly, Ohio maker of prefab kitchens said that it dropped the Union Pacific and the railroad industry entirely. According to the company, they give us excuses. They have derailments, floods, breakdowns, snow, just stuff you wouldn't think would happen. You would think if a truck can get through, why can't they? Let that last sentence sink in. In another UP debacle, a Texas rice producer tried to ship a carload of rice from Missouri to Tennessee. A month later, the car was spotted on a siding track. 
in Utah. And in yet another bizarre episode, a rail car full of liquid argon departed Houston for a customer in Southern California. Delays in shipment resulted in 90% of the contents escaping prior to delivery. Things got so bad that its CEO, Richard Davidson, was forced to publicly apologize to its biggest customers. Although U.S. railroads were deregulated heavily in 1980, vestiges of regulation have remained, including a special regime for dealing with mergers. Instead of being subject to the Department of Justice or Federal Trade Commission's merger review and enforcement procedures that apply to most other companies, railroad mergers were reviewed by the Interstate Commerce Commission until the end of 1995 and since then by the ICC's successor, the Surface Transportation Board. For much of the 20th century, railroads have fought a losing battle against trucks and occasionally pipelines, ships, barges, and airplanes. Although today's railroads still play a major role in U.S. intercity freight transportation, the industry's share was 41% in 1995, far below what it was in earlier decades of the 20th century. In some ways, the railroad's hardships were inevitable and couldn't be helped like the fact that the railroad's competitive edge was clearly hampered by the ICC's all-encompassing rate and service regulatory structure which had been the industry standard since 1887. At the same time, the railroad's hardships were also self-inflicted wounds including that same bureaucratic freight rate making ICC. Even the inclusion of interstate trucking into the ICC's regulatory regime in 1935 failed to stem the tide. This losing battle was first seen when the railroad's share of intercity freight dropped off drastically which the railroads didn't want anyway. Fine. Or maybe not. Apparently it never occurred to the railroad corporate heads that trucks then considered to be nothing more than a glorified four or six wheel vehicle of limited capacity wouldn't be content to just carry short haul and before they finally woke up trucks had skimmed off a sizable portion of the rail freight business. Starting in the 1950s, at least partly in response to the railroad's competitive and financial losses, the industry engaged in a long series of mergers which reduced the number of Class 1 railroads from 186 in 1920 to 39 by 1980. The mergers enlarged railroads' traditional regional scope, but no railroad gained direct national or even coast-to-coast -coast coverage, and the fact that to this day, no American-served railroad can reach all points of the nation puts railroading at a very clear disadvantage to trucks. As of 1950, a Class 1 railroad had to have at least $1 million in revenues. As of 1996, the minimum size was $255 million. Because of interchange arrangements, all railroads are connected to each other. That means their freight cars run on each other's tracks, and freight shippers that are at or close to a rail terminal can reach any other place that is close to a rail terminal. That, in a nutshell, is basically how railroads work. In 1980, Congress passed the Staggers Act, which substantially deregulated the railroad and the trucking industries and gave railroads widespread discretion for pricing flexibility up as well as down, but it also gave the truckers those same benefits. The industry quickly made use of its newly acquired flexibility. Prices, meaning freight rates, adjusted to new levels, reflecting in some instances competitive influences and in others railroads' exercise of market power. With greater flexibility in general, the railroad's share of the freight business stabilized and actually increased by a few percentage points, and mergers proceeded coup de gras apace. By 1995, the 39 Class 1 railroads of 1980 had dwindled to a minuscule 11 railroads. The era of the super mergers had begun. The Union Pacific's rail route structure connected three West Coast areas, the Pacific Northwest, Northern California, and Southern California, with Utah, from which its highly capacity double track extended east to Iowa and Kansas through what is known as the Central Corridor and also called the Overland Route. Previous acquisitions plus trackage rights with other railroads gave the UP access to Chicago, Milwaukee, and points in Minnesota to the north, as well as to Memphis, New Orleans, and the Texas Gulf Coast to the south. The UP had a reputation for having a strong management, attention to service, and cost efficiency. The Southern Pacific and its related companies had major lines from Portland to Los Angeles, the so-called I-5 corridor, and then to San Antonio, Houston, and New Orleans, together with important gateways into Mexico. Its central corridor route ran from Northern California to Utah and Kansas, and then to St. Louis, 
From there, Southern Pacific lines branched south to Louisiana and Texas and north to Chicago. But despite this seemingly strong route structure, the SP was widely perceived as having inadequate terminals and outdated locomotives and providing poor service. In August of 1995, the Union Pacific Corporation announced its plans to merge with the Southern Pacific Corporation, who by that time had become known as the Struggling Pacific, forming a 34,000-mile western railroading giant in 25 states to compete with the impending merger of the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railroads. At the time, Union Pacific ran from Chicago, St. Louis, and New Orleans to California and the Pacific Northwest. Southern Pacific dominated railroading in California with main lines to Chicago, Seattle, and New Orleans. UP and SP sources said that the combined railroad would form new routes that would be far shorter than at present and would give stiff new competition to the Santa Fe's Chicago-Los Angeles route, the longtime speed champion for time-sensitive freight. Other proposed advantages were that the UP would have the shortest route between Chicago and Southern California and they could offer single line service between Seattle and Western Canada and Southern California. A route then dominated by trucks on I-5, the I-5 corridor due to rail cars having to transfer between two or more rail lines. The crown jewel of UP's crown would be a single line from Texas to California which fulfilled a long time dream of UP along with revenge towards SP for the dirty little trick of the 19th century. When the UP predecessor, Texas and Pacific, and SP were building west toward El Paso, SP agents carted barrels of whiskey to the TMP workers, giving SP the edge in reaching El Paso first and building on to California. If the new railroad could overcome the antitrust issues, it would restructure Western railroading into two new massive super systems and complete the merger of the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific that began nearly 100 years earlier. It would also revive the question of whether the next step would be the first true transcontinental merger. Up to that point, no railroad had made any real attempts to breach the wall between the east and west that seems to run down the Mississippi River. UP said that the combined railroad would sell lines or grant rights to other railroads in instances where merger would end competition, which could set off a frenzy among NS, CSX, and other well-positioned smaller railroads to acquire lines into the Chemical Coast and other lucrative areas. The two mergers shrunk Class 1 railroading down from the era of the Super 7 to five dominant rail lines, the UP and BNSF in the west and the Big 3 in the east. You can make it six dominant systems if you want to add the KCS into that mix. At the time, UP valued the SP deal at $5.4 billion with so-called operational savings amounting to at least $500 million per year. Because the UP and SP had several similar routes and controlled most of the chemical traffic in Texas and Louisiana, naturally this concerned many shippers. And speaking of territory, it might surprise you to learn that at this time of the UPSP takeover, let's just call it what it was and what it always was intended to be, the Union Pacific headquarters was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The railroad industry continued its process of consolidation. Just three months after the STB's approval of the UPSP merger, CSX and Conrail announced an agreement to merge Conrail into CSX. A week after that, the Norfolk Southern made a higher offer for Conrail in which the great war for Conrail had begun. The three parties agreed that CSX and NS would jointly buy Conrail and divide its route structure and accompanying equipment between them. The deal was approved by the STB in June of 1998. With the dismemberment and disembowelment of Conrail, the number of Class 1 railroads in the United States will be seven if you count the two Canadians, with only two large carriers in the West, the UPSP and the BNSF, and two in the East, CSX and NS. It was only a matter of time until the managements of these railroads began exploring the possibilities of the inevitable East-West pairings that will create the nation's first true transcon. Enter one Ewing Hunter Harrison from the Canadian National who unsuccessfully tried to merge the Canadian National and the BNSF. Simultaneously, the Union Pacific began experiencing congestion and service problems as trains and shipments began slowing down and backing up and shippers and recipients began complaining about lost shipments and long delays. Despite the Union Pacific's management assurances in August of 1997 that the problems were being solved, the carrier service worsened. Newspaper articles described the UP's rail system as near gridlock in many places and touted many instances of losses and delays. Shippers were not only complaining to the UP but were also beginning to present claims for reimbursement for their losses. Press accounts also described the managerial and logistics problems the railroad had experienced in implementing the merger. 
For example, the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific had different computer systems and dispatching methods, and workers from the one system were unable to adapt readily to the other's computers and operations. Cutbacks in management, crews, and equipment, part of the so-called efficiencies of the merger, made the problems even worse. In September 1997, the UP proposed measures that were both extreme and outright embarrassing to a major railroad, but were also necessary given the extent of its problems. First, it announced a plan to charter a large container ship on the west coast, load it with the backed up containers stored in its western rail yards, and send it through the Panama Canal for delivery at the Texas Gulf Coast. That plan was scrapped within a few days in favor of a proposal to send its freight on competing trucks and rail carriers, including the Bensef, but that plan proved to be of limited help. Long after the merger and despite repeated assurances of service improvement, the UPSP continued to experience enormous problems, especially in the Gulf Coast area. Some shippers even called for reversing the merger. In 1998, the UPSP reported substantial operating losses and agreed to share track ownership and train dispatching in some areas with the BENSAF. Meanwhile, congressional hearings gave a forum for critics of Surface Transportation Board policy and this merger in particular. While the Union Pacific did eventually solve its logistics problems, and its predictions about the long-term consequences of the merger may even be true. The problem was that the short and even medium-run costs of the UPSP merger have clearly been substantial, and the experience provides an important cautionary argument to blind acceptance of supposed efficiencies and to the dismissal of concerns about market concentration. The supermergers of the 1990s happened more than 20 years ago, and I ask you now, does any of this sound familiar today?